There we go. <laughs> oh, it's that now it says live. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, hello to Virtual Trek Cons, the influence of strong women in Star Trek. And I am joined today with three outstanding women. We have Nana Visitor, who played Colonel Kira on Deep Space Nine. We have Mary Chico, mother of Klingons, Chancellor Lurel, and Amy Imhoff, who is um, spoken on many Star Trek panels. And you have a special connection with Star Trek as well, right? I do, I do. Um, I'm working with Kate Mulgrew now, and she's fantastic. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me, and this is going to be a great panel. Yes. <laughs> so um, we'd like to start off exploring the evolution of women's roles in Star Trek, um, starting with Michelle Nichols, obviously, and and um, and how it's evolved to Kira and Laurel, and and how the material has grown. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and I know, Nana, you were a, a watcher of the original series. So I was wondering how that um, influenced you. Or did Michelle Nichols have an influence on, on you and Kira and, and uh, your work? Uh, as, as an actor, yes, very definitely. Um, I took her, I took what I loved about what Michelle did is that she would watch the destruction of worlds with uh, a, a professional eye. This is what she did every day. Uh, there were disasters. There were reasons to stay calm and collected and be ready for action, be ready to do what she did, her job. She was always ready. And I took that part of it and realized that's what it takes. That's the world. And I think she showed that so brilliantly. I also think seeing that Nichelle, also the the other like peripheral women on TOS, you know, they were not in roles that were too prominent, but they were there. Um, and just to and just to just to have someone like Whoopi Goldberg be able to look at the screen and say, you know, Mom, there's a black woman on TV and she's not playing a maid incredible incredible for and the first interracial kiss and just some of the so many of the barriers that they broke mm -hmm. yeah it definitely made huge strides um for the time um there are still some issues with education <laughs> and <laughs> all of that stuff and, and women being used as as ornaments rather than driving the story but um that i think evolved in TNG, mm -hmm. with characters like Guinan and and um, Crusher and Troy, but then then it was shooken in my <laughs> we're shooken <laughs> with Mary, who yeah. was a fully realized person. She had layers and depths, and and she carried the story often. And I've I've seen parallels um, between. Kira and Laurel re-watching Discovery. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, would you mind? Yeah. You mind? I, I, I love that. And it's an honor to have any parallels drawn between me and Major Kira. So I'm very <laughs> uh, honored by that. Um, and I, I was uh, speaking to everyone uh, before this that I have been doing a Deep Space Nine rewatch. And yeah, just the from the get-go, Kira's intro of being so um, independent and strong and opinionated uh, and building that relationship with Cisco off, off the bat um, in her strength is just, it's, it was inspiring to watch when I first did and seeing it again is just very exciting. And something that I have been thinking about that parallel is they're so, um, both Laurel and Kira are um, so um, um, respectful of their heritage and have such a, a deep um, connection to um, 
to where they're from, which is not Federation. Like that's something that's really striking me overall with the Deep Space Nine rewatch is how much, not how many main non-Federation characters you have and what a great nuance that brings to the storytelling. Uh, I think an important nuance because it, the, 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 the world of the future is not just the Federation. And while uh, Laurel's storyline of course takes place far earlier in the timeline and we meet the Klingons when they haven't interacted uh, with humans for over a hundred years. Um, but that same level of the, as the series progresses and her interaction with humans, with <laughs> anything non-Klingon, she learns a lot, much the way Kira continues to learn about why the Federation behaves the way they does. It doesn't mean that they entirely, either of them lose their integrity of their own species, um, but they certainly allow themselves to listen and learn, which I think is a sign of a true leader, is someone who sticks to their own morals, but is willing to compromise and understand why uh, people are coming from different directions. So that is something that I've been um, picking up on. And uh, I love that. I think that's also, you know, such a true Trek thing to, to have that we get that window in to those types of characters through having alien species. Um, yeah. Also, I just seeing in the comments, someone said Kira is fire, and I love that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also, this is live, and we are taking questions. I saw a couple people asking that, so fantastic. And just on what, going off what you were saying, um, I just thought of this parallel just now when you were saying this, Mary, is that Bajor was just being brought into the Federation when Deep Space Nine started. It was like they're kind of like new members. They're not 100 percent sure what their, <laughs> you know, what 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 their role is going to be. Just like you know, when we see Laurel, Klingons are not part of the Federation. That like mm -hmm. peace treaty hasn't really happened. It's not yeah. really seen as like a Federation member yeah. so the importance of the the characters that are outside coming into the federation are kind of what makes the federation diverse it what makes the federation yeah. you know function in it's it's really like true sense and i think yeah. seeing nana as not a starfleet officer but still working so closely with cisco with you know dr bashir with cool. o'brien yeah. with everybody is a great is a, is a great dynamic to have because they're not she's not held to some of the same rules and yeah. like I, I'd love to hear Nana talk a little bit about you know what it was like kind of operating outside those rules uh you know I felt like I had to get comfortable with the idea of being unlikable mm -hmm. um I, I, and and that means I wasn't accepted because I was doing something different than what other people intended for me to do uh, not that I was wrong, although she often was, uh, but that I had to get comfortable with an audience that didn't want to see that, mm -hmm. um, with people at Paramount. Who didn't I feel like Mary knows your feel. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> yeah. And, you just, and, and that, I think, is when you make some difference, when you you go, no, this is my integrity, this is what... I believe the truth of this is and how someone responds to post-traumatic stress, to uh, being surrounded in the way that she was with uh, people with very, very different points of view and, and just accept that you're not going to be liked. That's what the experience was for me early on. Mm -hmm. um, it felt like a struggle and I remember when I was asked to to soften myself. Can't remember if it was a second or third season, but it's when the high heels come in. <laughs> um, and I remember I, we were on, you know, we were on break and I fought it with everything in my, it, in my body was enraged and hot with the idea that I'd have to wear heels, that I would have to conform with some kind of sexualized version of myself the way I talked myself through it was to go, if I can do it in flat boots, I can do the same thing in heels. It's not about the pose. It's not about the pose in the second, third, or fourth place. It's not about that. What, what am I doing? What's my character doing? And uh, that that struggle for it was uncomfortable. I, well, I did. It wasn't fun. It wasn't like yeah, no one likes me, and I'm really cool with it. It was tough. 
Of course I wanted to and women that. struggle so much with the society expectation of being likable. And I, you know, yeah. I'd love to hear all of you talk about that. And Melissa too, just because you're moderating doesn't mean you can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. And being pretty. Those two oh, things. Yeah. And I just read a quote and I can't remember who said it, of pretty isn't rent you pay for being a female. Um and, and taking up space. And I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about. Yeah, I mean, all everything you're saying. I, I mean, I was just like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's really interesting. I mean, I'm so grateful, ultimately, for the opportunity to play a flawed, interesting, complex female character. I mean, it's such a gift. But I absolutely agree with the feeling of, and I really struggled in the first season because for the first half, you get a window into <laughs> Laurel maybe isn't mm -hmm. evil, but a lot of people believed a lot of her actions were at the surface level were led to believe that they were extremely malicious and ultimately when you find out that you know it's not you know quite as malicious it's still very Klingon um but that she had um the Klingon integrity in mind and so I struggled as a very happy pleasant human person with seeing people reacting very intensely to the story they were being told rightfully so um, and I really had to, I did a lot of personal writing at the time, just in stuff I couldn't vocalize on, vocalize on the internet because I, I couldn't, um, to get God forbid for a woman on the internet with an <laughs> yeah. opinion. It's crazy. <laughs> um, but that I, overall, like, I'm so grateful for that experience and, and with Laurel too, the fact that I think the the frustration I seem to hear from people. Some people just love it and, and go for it. But I think people struggle with the fact that they don't absolutely hate her and yet they don't like everything she does. Like they, everyone wants to live in these binaries of like good, bad, like, uh, and, and she yeah. does, she doesn't live in that. She lives in the gray. And I love that about Kira as well is that while they have a lot of integrity and yeah, but are sometimes wrong, but they learn from their mistakes right, right. and it's so important and so groundbreaking. And I, you know, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be a Laurel without Akira. And like, that is just so important in our storytelling that we need to see that. And it's definitely, yeah, filtered into my own life. And yeah, again, as someone who does have a lot of energy and has been told to calm down a lot and you know oh girl oh girl you I know feel you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh I, but also I think for yeah. you and a little for me you know we're both yeah. very tall women and I yeah. think you know occupying space like Dana yeah. was saying is such a huge thing that you feel like you're too tall yeah. and too big yeah. and too to this and to that yeah. to be allowed yeah. to be able to flourish and you want to yeah. shrink yeah. yourself I have pictures of myself yeah. you know in in college and high school where I have my arms around my friends and I'm like scrunching mm -hmm. and I'm like no you have to stand up you know and I, I I want to hear Mary talk more about. We've talked about yeah. that yeah. with our <laughs> with our badass warrior ladies. It's it's true. I mean, I I have I often say that it's my journey on this earth is that I am six feet tall, and that is a part of my bigness. But it is coupled with my big energy, and I think exactly for any woman occupying space energetically, like for me, it is partly the fact that people meet me and go, "Wow, you are up there," <laughs> and because like, yeah. you rock your four inch heels like yes, you should. I love, I love my giant cop <laughs> efforts. What can I say? Um, but I, I do feel that that yes, there were small ways in which I would compensate for my size, um, whether it be in and also my intellect. Uh, that was a big thing in college that my voice and speech teachers really got on me about was I would say a very intelligent statement and go, but I don't know, or, you know, something, just a way to cushion it so that it wasn't as fully realized, even though everything I was saying was totally valid. And uh, that's part of what Laurel has continued to give me, you know, her journey from literally seeing herself as no one. Um within the Klingon world to having to lead the empire. Like that was very much re resonated with me during my time. And this was such a big first job and like being intimidated and scared and feeling like, where do I belong? So I have felt like with all of my characters, luckily they all bring out really interesting aspects of myself. So I've really tried to learn from Laurel standing in her power. And I love that she is innately strong from the beginning and yet she doesn't realize it. Like that, I think, is a very important thing to see as well, that she doesn't even realize her own capacity. Well, we see her when she's kind of in this pantheon of men. 
Yeah. And you know, you have a you have your fellow Klingon. What did someone call her? Like the Klingon with the bling on. Oh my god! <laughs> I had to you got to tell her that one. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. But you you see her and you don't immediately pick her out as someone who's going to be changing the action. She's yeah. you know, and I've talked about this with the Nas. You know, the the concept of feminist agency. Um, and I have my master's in literature, so I kind of bring that to this discussion as well. Um, which is feminist agency being that the woman, that the female character has the ability to drive her own action and to change her fate and the fate of many. Yeah. And I'd love to hear everybody talk about that a little bit too. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, change her fate and the fate of many. Um, it, that is agency. Um, and now I'm finding... Uh, a, a more it, it's as a storyteller a more subtle place for it um, because uh, if it I, I find myself more an old crone now is my truth and what does that mean sometimes it means going up into the mountain and taking a stick and digging in the dirt of your uh, you know fertile ground, you know, all by yourself. Mm -hmm. And as a storyteller, I go, well, am I affecting the fate of many? No, but the story of a woman having the right and, and, and being fully realized as, as a human to take that time to be an old crone uh, is valuable, maybe to many, maybe to one. And if it's just one girl watching and going, I have the right to go off by myself and figure it out mm -hmm. and not be a leader for a minute, not be a follower, join that when I need to, but follow what my path is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what um, true liberation is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I've always said that I, I want to be the role model I was looking for, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, and by being the best version of myself, I'm not going to be anybody else, but I can hopefully ignite a fire within someone that gets them to find their own greatest truth. Um, and I, you know, it's, I'm, I'm so, yeah, grateful that that is part of what we get to do as, as actors and artists is that by really tapping into that truth, other people can be inspired to do so. Yeah. All the archetypes. I love you bringing in the, oh, just, no, all, I just love, I love archetypes and all that, just like the hero's journey and storytelling. And I think the more we embrace them and continue to expand upon them, that's where I'm feeling we are just like as a society right now is those, there will always be there. So it's how do we respect that and keep expanding on it? And particularly with the female archetypes. And I really, the divine feminine was a huge element for me in the second season as chancellor and speaking to the, uh, when you were talking about costume as well and heels, cause I did end up being much more feminized in, in the second season and figuring out, I felt it made sense, you know, within, um, within the plot, within this patriarchal world that as chancellor, she had to subscribe to the norms more. And that was part of Gersha Phillips, our incredible costume designers, conceit was aside from wanting to just give me fun fabulous outfits um you know the fact that I did have cleavage and like there was um the you know the notorious Klingon boob window like all of these things that we've seen in the past and how these women have been sexualized in good or bad ways um how is Laurel trying to grapple with that um as a leader and ultimately instead of leaning more towards you know within the Madonna horror dichotomy leaning more towards actually the mother which kind of falls in between um the mother trope i think melissa yeah. you wanted to talk a little bit about that too oh yeah well mary was about to touch on it but um yeah it, it's interesting how um Lorel plays it becomes essentially the mother of klingons <laughs> the birth of her son and and um and the revolutionizing of her people and and i think it's interesting to see how how mothers have changed on trek as well mm -hmm. because 
they couldn't like in TNG they couldn't necessarily be mother and doctor they, it was always separate thing but but on Deep Space Nine with Keiko she was a botanist and a mother mm -hmm. and and worked together with that and 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 then Kira kind of taking on the to work in your pregnancy and being a mother on on the set of Star Trek yourself being a mother yeah, I, yeah. you know I that is that's something I find just fascinating because I've heard I've sometimes heard some of the men surrounding the show and the production of the show comment on that and I've heard you talk about it a little bit Anna. and just you know the way that they work that in and I you know just talking about that mother trope yeah it's it's funny with all the archetypes i used to think that it was you know it, it there was a progression and then you got to old crone but now <laughs> that I'm there, actually i realize you keep rifling through them all and sometimes in a day they're all available and all true mm -hmm. and it, it that's that's something i didn't understand before um but getting back to the mother aspect, yeah, it's something that I had to, I remember, I remember Buster, my, my oldest son being on set and he learned how to be quiet and he learned how to be there because we had to be together during the day because the days were so damn long. Um, and he would come on set and he would actually tell Grips, red light. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> That's so cute. He was trained, boy. And I remember being in some kind of crazy getup with the biggest weapon. And I was in, uh, you know, and I was like, oh my God, my son is seeing this. And then I went, yeah, my son is seeing this. This is, this is part of it. This is mama at work. This is. We have a comment, Nana, from the comments. If you could move closer to your mic, because people are having a hard time hearing you. <laughs> oh no, that's terrible! I'm supposed to use my outside voice. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> just moved into this house, and where I am right now is really echoey. So it's going to sound like I'm sure the next uh, mountain can hear me, but I'll I'll do it. I'll be. Thank I'll be you. Mother. Yeah, we just want to make sure everyone hears your awesome insights. So sorry, everybody. That's awful. But yeah, so it, part of being a mother on Star Trek for me was accepting that my son is going to see his mother working, mm -hmm. his mother shooting weapons, his mother mm -hmm. being even a, a sexualized person. It was the, the full gamut uh, he experienced me as. Mm -hmm. And do you think that Laurel, if she had been you know, a mother to raise her child, you know, mm -hmm. that would have been, that's like, seems like it's part of Klingon culture to like respect the mother as the life giver and as a, as a, as a strong warrior role. It's not seen as something that puts you on a sideline. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting overall. And I have been, look, I mean, I looked at it initially when I was looking at all the Klingon centric episodes and I often reference the, um, Grilka episode because that the whole premise of that is that she cannot succeed her house because she's a woman and has to marry Quark. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> Imagine having to marry Quark so you could yeah. do your thing. Like this incredibly <laughs> badass woman who has like the such a cool intro in her cape and all this stuff is like has to marry this guy in order. It's like okay, this is a great commentary on so many things. Um, but that was definitely a moment I had been witnessing that throughout with the Klingon culture. But I was like, oh, so it really is a patriarchy, and it really is you know, the, the women powerful as they are, and certainly to Federation human eyes, very intimidating, um, for the most part. And we see that with Cirilla as well with Martok, like that, that, that their responsibility and their power is in the house, which is a totally respectful thing to be. Um, but that was definitely a key in to Lorel uh, from the get go that she was not that she was a commander. So she was already an outlier. And Takuma's house was the kind of outsider house to begin with. So she was, you know, and that was why she loved Vogue so much was that they were both very much on the outside. Um, but to your question about motherhood and yeah, that tie in, I found that her journey in point of light in the second season was that she had to do what unfortunately many women have to do is cut off 
all of their affections, cut off the, their loved ones in order to maintain their job. Uh, and that's what Giorgio, who is the <laughs> empress of a very cutthroat uh, world, uh, tells her to do. And so, of course, Giorgio is going to tell her that because that's the society that she existed in. Um, so it's, you know, it's a shame that Cornwell didn't come in and say like, hey, Laurel, maybe you don't have to do this whole really big theatrical thing where you pretend to kill your lover and your son but <laughs> it's very shakespearean though very Mary. Shakespearean. <laughs> believe me as an actor thrilled absolutely when i read that speech i was like are they really gonna let me do this like am i actually gonna like tell people call me mother like in a full and um so that was such a thrill and again the archetype of it is just so incredible but i i found too a huge parallel to the queen elizabeth the first and virgin queen and the way in which so many women have had to create an archetype for themselves in order for people to listen to them. I find Laurel's plot very tragic throughout, like, <laughs> um, but powerful and empowering, but very tragic that all the people that she loves um, ultimately are taken away from her, but she is so, um, you know, set on upholding her her culture, and again, looking at the parallels with Kira, like, is so respectful of where she comes from and wants to maintain that integrity, um, that she's willing to make those sacrifices uh, for the greater whole. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I it's it's interesting because there's obviously a lot of commentary and controversy within all of those plot lines, but I think overall. Um, that is a huge part of her journey is, is sacrifice for the greater whole. Um, and, yeah. and, Mo and Melissa and I were discussing um, about how, you know, she had grown up watching Kira and watching, you know, the women of DS9 and Voyager. And, you know, I'm curious what your thoughts are, Melissa, on seeing that and seeing the, the, seeing the progression of like the over-sexualized, you know, the, the caregiver roles on TNG to, to Kira and now to Laurel. Like, how did you grow up in that and how did that shape you? Well, honestly, I didn't really connect with the over-sexualized roles, so I didn't really pay much attention to them. Um, what made me sit up and take notice of Kira was because she was she had a voice, and and I know in, in growing up for me, a lot of times I was you know, meant to be seen and not heard. So there was a lot of, and I'm still trying to find my voice and she has her voice. And it, 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 she's a, a, was a good example of how, how a, this strong woman had something to say and people paid attention and rightfully so. And, but at the same time, she was, she accepted her cho the choices that she made, whether they were right or wrong, um, and and accepted the consequences that came with those choices. And that was important to see as well. Mm -hmm. and, and and struggling through um, your, making carving your own path, as Manat was saying, finding your own journey. It, it, that Kira was helpful in that, and and I see that a lot in Laurel too, where she's put in a situation where it, it is a male dominated society, but she's carving her way through mm -hmm. to leading the charge of Klingons, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know she's the head of the empire, <laughs> yeah. And I loved because it, it's like it's also like. I, I say this about any any leader, and and certainly now I'm like, God bless you, like, like I know, right? You're wanting yes. or like you're just being willing to take the mantle of leadership because it's a hard job. No, like even the best of the leaders, it's it's complicated and you struggle, and no one is ever like not everyone is going to agree with you ever, and like <laughs> it's just such a difficult position to put yourself in, and yet we need those people, and I think we need those women specifically. Um, who I believe have a very strong aptitude for leadership. I was just talking uh, with a friend earlier today about um, directing um, and the, the, the willingness to just put yourself out there. 
um, like have the confidence of a straight white cis male and just say, Hey, I'd like to direct. Yes. <laughs> my, favorite is, my favorite is have the confidence of a mediocre white man named yeah. Chad. Yes. <laughs> but I think, you know, there's, there's, you know, it, there's something to that, that I think it's great that I'm glad that I'm someone that tends to overthink and be like, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm not ready, but find that balance of being like, okay, I don't think I'm ready but I'm going to make the leap anyway, because this is clearly needed right now. And like I said, for Laurel, certainly realizing that her, her society needs that more than she needs to be in the shadows, that that's the more important thing. This, I, this is a slight tangent, but it's just staying in my brain and I don't want to lose it because I think it's important to note too, that both of these characters are alien women. And yes, I, it was right in the beginning what you were saying Nana, about like the way in which people may judge those characters, I found too, not only as a woman, but as an alien, people would hold Laurel to human standards mm. instead of taking into account that it's like, that's not the society she grew up in and right. Kira's past and being with the Kardashian, like it's, it totally makes sense that they have the mentalities they do based off of their experiences. But I find it a really interesting thing um, that I probably would note if I were just an audience member in people's comments, but particularly because I take it so personally because I've thought a lot about why she behaves the way she does. It's I think it's one of the most fascinating and it's such a great gift as an actor to really see, oh, you guys are, you're totally saying that this is how a human would behave, but we're not human. So, yeah. Right. And, and I'd also like to point out that it's a gift at both Mary and the Oz commitment to bringing the truth of Laurel and Kira to the screen and not shying away from, well, no, uh, it, they're not going to like me because of this, this, and this, and actually committing full head on mm -hmm. uh, to the roles. Otherwise, you know, it, 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 they would just be like any other role. Oh, here, yeah. and, and I think that another difference um, between Oh, did, Kira, did, Nana, did you want to say something? <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you, first of all. And then second of all, it was also at a time in the 90s, there was, I don't know if they still have a Q rating, but it was really your likability factor. Mm. And it mattered if you got work based on how much you were likable. And they used to say, um, when you went into a room of producers, the most important thing, and I was told this by an agent, I won't say the word, but that they wanted to go to bed with you. It was like, well, do I want to go to bed with you? No. So I don't think yeah. And so we actually. What the role was. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that was, that was part of it. So pleasing and being likable. And, and I, and it, so. Star Trek, and by the way, Major Kira, as far as I know, was written by men. Yeah. We are getting a couple of comments um, about what do you think about how Star Trek, especially Deep Space Nine, was written, produced, and directed almost entirely by men. <laughs> well, <laughs> so. my first comment is they wrote Major Kira. Mm -hmm. they, they wrote her right. and said, go on, go on and do that, and really didn't stop me very much. Only when they got outside pressure is what I understand that then they said, okay, look, uh, but we got to, you know, so that, that in itself was impressive. Um, <laughs> they also didn't hide my pregnancy. Another big, big, you know, kudos to them uh, and, and, and that whole uh, producing team. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I would, as I was saying, it's just, it, to go against being likable, being pleasing, all the things I was taught to be as not just an actor, but as a woman. Um, it, 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 Star Trek gave me the opportunity to go, okay, here's a reset. Mm -hmm. And certainly I took it, I had a, I had a, a, a seed, you know, uh, of that in me, but it certainly yeah. flourished after I did seven years of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And I think seeing Ira um, talk about it in the Deep Space Nine documentary, 
uh, was really incredible to see, you know, I, I've having met Ira and interviewed Ron Moore and Brian Fuller and everyone, they are some really excellent feminist men. And it's, yeah. it's definitely a kudo to them that they created characters like Kira and Dax and Zial and, mm -hmm. you well, know, Moogie and all the, all the DS9 ladies. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm so glad this is coming up too. Cause I, in being a part of the franchise for now, a fair amount of time, like, you know, it, I, I'm still, they were still the newbies, but I'm, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm, You're in, in, it. It. I'm in it now. Um, but uh, I have always been uh, an advocate for representation on screen, um, but I have had a new fire lit under me about representation behind the scenes. Um, and I do agree, like it is important to celebrate and acknowledge allies. And I, I say allies and advocates, because that's the difference is like, of course, compromise. Like I said, Laurel does it too. Like we all have to work with a lot of different cooks in the kitchen and it's, that's, it's a collaborative art form. So that's part of it. Um, but I do think, you know, I hope that th this conversation needs to be had because it's easy when we're, when it's just what we're seeing on screen, it's like, Oh, look, it's a multitude of people of different new that's super great. But you need you need those allies and advocates and and now I think you know there are huge pushes of for writers' rooms to be more diverse. Um, or normalized is actually a term that I've been hearing and really liking. That it's it's not about it's it that's still kind of others diverse like to mm -hmm. make it diverse as if yeah. it's like the thing that we're creating, as opposed yeah. to like, yeah, let's just make it look like the world that we're in. Uh, so I, I've been right, liking that term, but the more that we normalize our, 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 our writer's rooms also, it, you know, from the top up, like when you were saying, it's like, even if the people at the core are on your side, they're still having to answer to higher ups and higher ups. So it's like, I'm hoping that that is the journey that we're on right now is making those spaces more and more normalized. Um, so that the person making that final decision is of a, of, of a, some sort of other and i hate the like the, the term other. yeah the othering of, of of basically anyone that isn't a white cisgendered man is yeah. is um you know we're really trying to get away from that as an industry and it's yeah. as someone who studies television and sees what's going on behind the scenes it's so fantastic to see Hanel culpepper and to mm -hmm. see that she directed, she's the you know, first woman of color to be directing a, a premiere of Star Trek, probably the first woman, period, to be directing a, peer, a premiere of Star oh. Trek. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just the, the representation we have in Discovery is above and beyond even what we had. And Deep Space Nine has a huge cast, yeah. you know, and they, they are of significant diversity, which is wonderful. Uh, but the women, you know, when we look at the convention lineup for women, you know, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a lot of white ladies. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really glad to have Discovery cast come in and to represent that for female fans of color. Yeah, and I think yeah, like we oh yeah, uh, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. Like the beauty of that is our work is never done. Like <laughs> that there's still um, there's still room to keep. To, to, to keep expanding, which is wonderful. Um, but and, still yeah. there are people at the absolute top, the ones who are green light projects, we won't have interesting, you know, who are diverse. Yeah. We won't have the stories that they want to see from their childhood, from their lives. You know, right. our stories are very, we have a couple of stories, it seems. Yeah. And it's filmed, it's getting better, yeah. but um, yeah. It's, yeah, it, it it has to be from the top and seeping all the way down. Yeah, absolutely. To grip. Yeah, and yeah. Ev everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the push too. Like I mentioned, Gersha, who's our incredible costume designer, and I I've definitely celebrated that in any way that I can amplify and you know just make people aware of who's working behind the scenes because and I think there's a large push for that overall there was for so long this sort of like here it is and magic happens and this happens but now we're getting to say like look look at this female director look at this female costume designer of color and mm -hmm. um wh whatever that combination may be like that acknowledgement uh whether it be a behind the scenes video or just a post um, I think that that's really important because people watching the show may love it, but don't see themselves as the actors in it. 
but but want to be yeah. a part of it. So the more that they can see, oh, there are so many other ways that I can contribute to mm -hmm. this storytelling. Like, so I think it's really right. important to celebrate that too. I like Bowie Young Kim as yeah. well as writers and yes. yeah. Yeah. yeah, and just even just seeing just seeing Sinequa and Rika Sharma and um uh I don't want to mispronounce her name <laughs> on the bridge crew. Oh, um, Oyen. Oyen, yes, yeah. Oyen, um, mm -hmm. who I've met and is lovely. And yeah. it's you know, just seeing just the diversity of just even the background bridge crew on Discovery, just the, yeah. the people walk you know, I I read a criticism of uh, you know, Rogue One when they're walking through in Star Wars, when she's walking through um, with one Mothma and they're walking yeah. through the people in the rebellion and everyone around them that is doing something, acting busy, fixing a ship, yeah. you know, running, running yeah. supplies. It's all like dudes. Yeah. It's like, it's like, right. where's all the women working on, you know, where, where yeah. are the Kaylee firefly type engineers, yeah. you know, like, like, I mean, look at Bolana. Bolana was a huge evolution. Yeah. You know, I have a very good friend who is a, a doctor um, and she's a, she's a, a woman, a Latina woman of color. And she loved, see, she said, I'm, she's the only one. She yeah. said, she's, Bolana was the only woman in STEM that I ever saw, mm -hmm. uh, growing up. And that's just, yeah, you're like I, real, yeah. terrible. And I think it's important to acknowledge that exactly the, the seeing people in the background is, is just as important. Like you, you just to see things more normalized, this term that I love now is, is, is just so essential because it, it makes you realize that that's what you want to see. And I definitely have realized, because I grew up, I literally called the like action and sci-fi movies, boy movies. And it was this cool thing that my dad and I did together, which, because I loved them. And, but I was like, I was cool for me to be the girl that liked boy movies. And that was because it was mostly men in them. Um, but I still love the storytelling. And I didn't, for the most part, uh, see myself in a lot of, certainly on, on the film side of things represented. Um, and now looking at a show like Discovery and then looking back at Deep Space Nine, when you do have more of a wealth, you're like, oh, why would I accept anything other than this? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I, I look back at movies that I really loved and I'm like, gosh, like, I'm a little mad. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, you get a little mad when you get a little older and you realize. <laughs> I, you, I, just, I, would, I would sit in feminist uh, classes in college and be like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just, I like, don't realize it. You know, with the, there's a Bechtel test and uh, we, there's like a Chifo test that my friends joke about, like that um, with certain films, my, my dear, dear uh, friend Eve is a big movie buff and she's more tolerant. She is a very strong feminist herself, but is a little bit more like, there are no women in this film. That's okay. I'm going to watch. But so often. Yeah. Maybe, maybe like, for some of our viewers, you could define the Bechdel test for them. Oh yeah. Bechdel test is um, created by, do you remember the, uh, her first name Bechdel? It is. A, uh, a yes, movie. it is. Uh, it's, um. Oh my I God, it'll come to me. She just, yeah, she's Allison, a, a, Allison Bechdel. Allison yeah, Bechdel. and she wrote actually Fun Home, which they- um, Yes, I love Fun Home. A, a graphic novel that then they turned into the musical. Um, but the test essentially is if two women are in a scene together speaking about something other than a man, um, for, is it- It's two like two women, women with, with a name who speak, of, who talk to each other about something other than a man. Yeah. And I think it has to be at least, at least a minute or two minutes. I don't remember. It's, it's the time. The time frame is is I think not as often applied, but yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. But but generally, and and uh, I I know um, I forget who did the said well maybe it was Women at Warp that they did. It was yeah, it was Jarrah Hodge from Women at Warp. She watched every single episode of Star yeah. Trek and applied yeah. the Bechdel oh. test. And it gets wow. better and better with each with each show. And part of that, yeah, I remember, with, Enterprise, with Enterprise, it goes way down. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <I'm> right <back. laughs> but, 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 but having Kira, I mean, Kira had so yeah. many, and Dax being the science officer, exactly. and you know, I want, and definitely, we talked about wanting to hear about the relationship between women on the show because that's such an important, you know, having Kira and Dax be good friends and be lifting each other up, like women lifting each other up, you know, was such a part of our conversation that we had leading up to this panel and i'd love to hear everybody talk about that mm -hmm. yeah well i feel like ira it was interesting to hear ira talk because he he said we missed the boat with having more of a relationship between the women we had a friendship but it was it wasn't as developed as it could be really we could have had much more of a relationship i think and mm -hmm. i'm 
not I, he doesn't know why that happened. It was just a missed opportunity. So many stories to tell. Mm -hmm. But in hindsight, and I agree, I feel like that could be that could be an interesting story now, Kira and Jack. Mm -hmm. I would love to see. Oh what, what do you well? What do you think Kira and uh, is up to now? I don't know. I'm you know it's it's a collaborative art, and they provided the situations, and I provided my responses to those situations. So without the situations, I don't know. I don't know where she is. I don't know how she ends up. Um, but she's I, lifting other women up. That is what she's doing. <laughs> I would hope so. But yeah. she decided to go sit in a tree. I don't know. <laughs> because they would see that she was doing what was correct for her. Mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's all I can think. Of. So I'm not sure, but I could hope, and I could hope that uh, she and Dax are doing something extremely interesting. Yeah. Something really interesting. Something, um, I don't know, biodynamic comes to mind. I don't know. <laughs> I love that. And also, uh, you know, Kira was a mentor for Zial, and, you know, and unfortunately she died. And, you know, but just seeing Kira as a mentor, I think, to, to young girls watching, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and Mary, Mary said she's rewatching Deep Space Nine and, you know, that kind of thing. I Just love that relationship. I loved a mentoring relationship. I wish it could have been longer. I truly yeah. think it had something to do with the makeup. They couldn't find oh. a woman who could, who would come back a second time, it seemed. There were three different Zials. So <laughs> it, it work. Yeah. But um, I would have loved that. Another opportunity, again, just not time for the story. I would have loved more of a relationship between the baby Igor and mm -hmm. the biological mother. I would have loved for the two of us to have had a relationship. That would be very interesting to me as well. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would expect that Kira wouldn't necessarily be responding correctly and just go oh here's your child i i have no feelings about this and it's okay i think yeah. the complication of emotions uh whether they're correct or incorrect would have been very interesting in that relationship yeah. not with orion with keiko mm -hmm. right yeah, yeah. We, like we never we rarely saw keiko conversing with the other ladies yeah. it was just kind of like a handoff of the babies like okay <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's so. Yeah. Like they started to go there in the beginning when when Keiko invited you to move in, but um, but there wasn't much beyond that. No, and that can, what what they played with, with, which was interesting as well, was the complication with O'Brien. Right. right. Feeling of a mother and a woman who's born her child. That would that's interesting to me. That's yeah. something that would that could yeah. really be explored. Yeah. Well, that's the next one. Yeah. Well, it is interesting because just tying back into the, um, that is part of why my champion, championing, not that I have much power in that regard, but wanting to at least vocalize the representation behind the scenes. Cause I do think that's a great example of like a woman writing would instinctively, whether they'd had a child or not, you know, um, know that there is a relationship to pine there. And I found too, like for me, um, my relationship with Cornwell, with the magnificent Jane Brooke, um, mm -hmm. you know, that there was such a strong response to the fact, you know, these women whose introduction was screaming in each other's faces, but then built a friendship as a consequence. See, but you know, seeing, seeing them screaming at each other, like yeah. you never, you don't see that on TV. Like yeah. no matter if it's Star Trek, sci-fi, anything yeah. else, yeah. rarely do you see two women screaming in each other's faces on television. <laughs> because as yeah. Nana said, God yeah. forbid that, that Q rating goes down and they're yeah. not likable. Yeah. And I will say that that episode uh, was written by Kirsten Bach. Are incredible. Um, Who is awesome, writer. and we have to yeah. give her a prop. She is a great yeah. voice to have at the table. Yes, and just hugely, you know, proactive both with Discovery and Picard, and um, I'm, you know, she she knows canon so well and all of that. But it, it is it is interesting to note that that is the episode that she wrote in the first season. Um, but aside from that, I think you know, I know Sonequa and I also found this in our uh, finale of the first season, and she's spoken to this as well that. Um, 
when she does give me the detonator, uh, there was a line that unfortunately was cut uh, for time or I don't know. <laughs> but uh, Giorgio, as she's about, to, she, you know, says Giorgio, give her the thing so she can put her handprint. And Giorgio's like, why would you give this to your enemy? And uh, Burnham said, today she is not my enemy. And, oh, they cut that? Yeah. That's an awesome <laughs> line. And we, have, and we haven't talked about Burnham enough, and we haven't talked about Janeway, yeah, but this is an hour-long panel. Yeah. And you guys are the, the people here, so we want to focus on you guys. Yeah. Well, but yeah, That's such a it. powerful yeah. scene. That was such a powerful then, scene you had. Yeah. Yeah. And it was still, I think, you know, ultimately it was partly because Sonico and I adore each other so deeply and have a deep respect. And just, yeah, again, there's so much I could say about Burnham and Sonequa, but her as a leader and being our number one and being such a, a mother to us all in many ways, while also being a literal mother, uh, <laughs> um, the way that she brought us all together. But this was a culmination. and We hadn't had much screen time together. Our characters had been parallel throughout the season. And luckily, because she would organize game nights and movie nights, I was getting to know her and we were doing press and stuff, but we didn't really get to act much. So we were like taking this moment together, like, oh, yes, um, we actually got uh, reprimanded for loving each other too much. <laughs> uh, you got reprimanded. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, that element of like, we were so, we saw that, you know, and, and the parallel that ended up happening that it was also cut was after I say I'm no one and then. Tyler Voke speaks to me, then I dis make that decision and said to her in Klingon, today you are not my enemy. Um, and that's when I accept the detonator. And so I think these moments, these seeds are there and we need to keep, we need to keep watering them and keep uh, letting those yeah. flowers and trees and, you know, forests grow because it's so right there. And I think, you know, to like, it, it Speaking of, of Kirsten, again, I remember talking to her about the finale for the first season. And when you look at it, it's all the women that kind of come together. You have and, and Cornwell comes yeah. in. And Cornwell. Just, I just I loved that. Yeah. yeah. And, and DS9, always, like you said, DS9 did not get that necessarily get the woman uh, like the woman of Marvel yeah. like all joining <laughs> together kind of a vibe. Together. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but definitely it's, you know, it's there. Like, again, like what I feel in, in loving the franchise as a whole and watching the different shows is like, it, you do see such a clear progression. And I do give huge credit to the actors like Nana, who brought their full selves and made those characters who they were. Like, that's a huge part of it. It is, is, is the energy that fans respond to. They feel the character. And sometimes the writing reflects the energy and sometimes it maybe doesn't quite rise to it. And that's, you know, that's art. That's, we're all just trying to make it work. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's coming from a malicious place on the part of anybody uh, behind the scenes. It's just, I think, you know, that's what I witnessed too. And certainly the other, you know, characters that did inspire me growing up, it was their energy. And sometimes the plot, rose to the occasion of the energy I was seeing in the character but more often than not it's that essence that I responded to I'm like wow she's really standing in her power or like that's something that seems really um asp aspirational but but yeah just with the finale I remember Kirsten Byer saying it was inevitable that the women would basically save the world because if I hadn't had the relationship with Cornwell I don't think I would have been primed to accept Burnham's generosity mm -hmm. then Cornwell is already doing her other stuff and listening to Burnham as and and then Giorgio even uh is willing to help at the end of the day like she is within her her own uh mere universe opinion still willing yeah. to come and, uh, and we didn't even get and we only have like six minutes left but we didn't even get a chance to talk about intendant Kira who I found very powerful oh, yeah. and and that was you know I'm sure that we can if we have a part two of this ever, <laughs> we'll, we'll have even more topics. But we got a great question from uh, a, a viewer, which is, if uh, which, which female world leader, past or present, do you feel represents your character? Ooh. It's a good one, right? Yeah, it's a really good one. One I probably can't answer. I, I would have to go off to my tree. Yeah. <laughs> and think about that one uh, before I could give you an answer. I'm mm. not sure. Mm. I think Jacinda Ardern of, of New Zealand right now, I feel Kira vibes hey. in her because she's a mom. She's basically like nursing her baby while saving the world from coronavirus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I like that. Takes no shenanigans. She is yeah. awesome. 
What um, do you think about Orel? Do you, do, you, do you see a parallel? Are we still not there yet? <laughs> no, I mean, I think because being in this Klingon society, we actually got to go a little bit more in the past. Um, and I, like I said, the Queen Elizabeth I, certainly that ascension um, was, a, was a huge source of inspiration in the second season. And then this is kind of the possibly... I was always fascinated by Hepchetsut, who is the, was a female pharaoh. She was not a queen; she was a pharaoh. She and she um, dressed um, like a male pharaoh and like had the little beard, whatever thing. And um, when she died, she and she um, became queen by a fluke. Like her her son was too young, and she was kind of his uh, whatever that word is. You know what I'm saying? Like not caretaker, but his, his uh, like yes yes she's like the queen regent or something yeah, they yeah, call that. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. um but then really did a lot of stuff and one of her uh, monuments is, is still in existence but legend has it that all of the images of her were destroyed immediately after she died um and they don't know who but i always wondered as i was you know living in laurel uh, and and exploring her journey I was also like, why isn't she talked about other than the literal reason that this show is being written at a later time. But I found it interesting that it's, it's a truth that um, we unfortunately see a lot, particularly with female leaders um, or leaders who do not fit the conform, typical form. Who don't conform. Their, their history is erased. And uh, so that's just uh, something that's more, that's more of my fun creative brain being like, why don't we talk about Laurel? Which I still think there's room to explore. Um, you know why why that is true that's um that's yeah <laughs> i'm glad you think so i think i mean i yeah do you, I, so, do you, so so maybe do you guys have a character on star trek that you feel like you love and admire you know obviously you love and admire your own characters but who who else did you find to be really awesome and inspirational for you inspirational while i was doing the, the just role. any even now just seeing what's what's new it just any character on female character on star I, trek who you like a lot i love laurel i love <laughs> laurel. i really do and of mary um, <laughs> that, that combination is a great combination that you can be an advocate and such an intellectual force and be involved in the star trek show that's on right now that makes me really happy. Really, really happy. Thank you. That it's. I'm like just trying not to cry right now. It's fine. Don't cry. <laughs> Melissa, okay, so Melissa loves Kira. Melissa, who else do you love of so much? Who is one of your faves? Well, um, before Kira, it was Guinan, but um, I'm loving. I I love Laurel too. Um, there's just so much richness to her and so much to learn about her and it she makes me want to learn more about her mm. it, and I, I want to see more stuff with Laurel and see where she came from how did she become mm. the head of her house yeah because yeah. of a, a male dominant society yeah. and and what she does with her role as chancellor yeah we have two minutes, yeah. so tell people where to find you after just, after Mary answers. Two, yeah. two, oh, yes. I'm, I just want to do it before we, <laughs> because we have like the countdown clock and it's like giving us stress. Okay. <laughs> so um, just tell people after you talk, Mary, where to find you and then any uh, charities you'd like to champion and Melissa and Nana do the same. Okay, cool. Well, I, and, and, and truly uh, this is, I, Kira yeah. is, is huge inspiration. I mean, Deep Space Nine, I got sucked in because of Kira and Dax and those characters and their unique journeys and their 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 nuance and like I said earlier, the the way in which Nana and Terry brought themselves to the roles. Um that was it's it's a huge inspiration. And there's a really fun picture. I I I'm sure you remember this or not when I met you guys in Dortmund, I think it was. I was like, Can we get a selfie? And it was like, <laughs> the greatest moment because i i do really feel um that um those characters and and doing this rewatch right now i'm really particularly curious fire that anger that uh, letting her have that and yet be extremely vulnerable and and 
there's there's so much nuance there, which again I credit so much to you, Nana, and what you brought to it. So it's uh it's a love fest, but it's such a real, real love fest because I I I genuinely feel that way and I'm just so grateful that um we we all get to be a part of this franchise together. Dang. So where can we find you, Mary? I am Mary the Chief on all platforms. So it's a play on my name. And you can find me on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Dana, what about you? Any, uh, any uh, find uh, you and. We manage one at a time, it seems. So I'm the not visitor on Twitter. Can I'm, 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 yay. yay. Melissa. Well, I'm on, on Melissa Longo everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. And I am I am the recently switched over Amy Imhoff1701 uh, on, on Twitter and Instagram. And also wear a mask. Yes. Or the 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 Chancellor and the Major will come for you. <laughs> and go yeah, so yeah, thank yeah. every yeah, Melissa wrap us, wrap us. Yes. We're wrapped. No. <laughs> no, I want to uh, thank everyone for coming and joining us. And and this was such a fun chat. They, you're all some of my favorite people. So that um, means a lot, too. And uh, and I want to thank Ryan for putting this up. Mm -hmm. Tretcon, for putting it together, because I know we're all missing Vegas and, and wishing that we could be together and give hugs. And I can't wait. For hug fest <laughs> i can't either so thank you guys so much this was so great and thank you for letting us all just give this love fest for laurel and kira this was fantastic <laughs> it's an honor so great thanks so much guys thank you all for watching thanks guys